my turn there. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 12. The title of the sermon is called, yeah, Is It Enough? Is It Enough? The subtitle is, Your Works versus Christ's Finished Work. Start reading in verse 12. We'll go through verse 23. Give thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, speaking of his dear Son, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, who are sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. As believers, we know and are convinced that there is only one gospel, and that gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This is what God has decreed eternally. It's his predestinated, God-appointed means to bring his people to faith. And we know that this truth of the gospel is what sets people free. God does not set people free with a lie. We also know that, as I implied in that last line, that there is no lie of the truth, it says in 1 John. And we know, um, we conclude from all that, and I've said this many times, it seems like it's pretty something easy to swallow for believers but I've said this uh, for example on social media and the pushback when I say this the gospel must be true to qualify as the gospel to even begin with you wouldn't believe the amount of people that push back against that simple true statement so as we grow as we are given spiritual life and given faith and we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should see him more and more high and lifted up as we learn more. We see him more clearly, more deeply. We have appreciation more and more for the Lord Jesus Christ and and the grace of God in Christ. And as far as us, as far as who we are, we should be thinking we in and of ourselves, that he must increase and we must decrease. We grow down in humility. So we realize he is enough and that we are not enough. We never can be in and of ourselves enough to be acceptable to God by ourselves. Also, as we grow, we might notice uh, as we mix it up with people that talk about the Bible and so on, we'll see maybe 
a group of people that might start using similar language. We always get excited, like maybe he believes what I believe, you know? And you get to talking to them and we see that some of these people, they'll assign different definitions to the terms we use from the scripture. And we'll see maybe some of these people that claim to believe the doctrines of grace, we find out it's merely lip service. And we see that some of these people have watered down the doctrines of grace so much that these doctrines are unrecognizable compared to what we see in the scripture. And not just that, not just merely unrecognizable, we have to conclude that it's an opposing message. It's the very doctrine of Antichrist. So these things, eventually as we grow, they become clear, and we're able to see them and expose them, defend the faith. So today as we go through these, uh, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23, and I want us to see that this gospel that we have, the only gospel available, uh, it's an all-the-way gospel, right? Um, we are guarded where we see these people water down the gospel. This is an all-the-way gospel. In other words, it's a gospel as it truly is in God's Word, uh, without changing or compromising the offense of the cross to please men, to tickle their ears, and give them space so that they can brag and boast. We can't allow that. So our text today, as we look through... Um, 20 through 23, I want us to look at this gospel and have some assurance from this gospel. We want to see two extreme things. He is enough, and we never have been and never will be in and of ourselves. If you can keep those two things in front of you and amplified in both directions, no reason why you can't have assurance of salvation. So this means that the only true gospel has the only singular, qualified, correct, true, and actual object of God-given faith. And God irresistibly, monergistically, effectually, powerfully works in the elect at conversion to show the Lord Jesus Christ that object of faith. That's where our faith looks. God causes this to happen. Of course, he, we know, say, for example, in John 6, it says that, speaking of this faith, it's a work of God. It is a complete work of God. Ephesians 1 talks about that this work of God, this faith worked in the elect, is at the same level of power that it took to raise Christ from the dead and exalt him on high. That's some power. And free willers, they want to compete with that, right? So <clears throat> we know that to show himself, and uh, that, is, that is what it means to glorify himself in the hearts, and, and God does show himself to his people. He does a work, and he shows people who he is in that work that he did. Uh, you don't have to turn there if you don't want. You can if you want. Second Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. I just want to read these. It's kind of this idea of God glorifying himself in the hearts of his people when he converts them. So it makes a distinction here. It talks about the God of creation. God who commanded, verse 6, the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face, or in other words, the person of Jesus Christ. God has powerfully done this. He has given us, says to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then verse 7 says we have it. We have it as believers. And what is it? What is it called? This treasure. Is that not a treasure? to have this displayed in your mind by the power of God. We have it in earthen vessels wherever we go. Uh, that or so that the excellency of the power of God 
the power may be of God and not of us. So we see the contrast there. It, like, we're not enough. He is enough. He does this work. It's His power, and it's not of us. Pretty clear. Um, Paul and some of the other writers, they always they'll go as far as using the, the opposites, the antithesis to show. Like, you're not going to walk away scratching your head. I wonder what Paul said. He said, the power's of God, and it's not of us. There, there's really no in-betweens. He's enough. We're not enough. That's why it has to be this way. So God has said in His Word here that He has done this for those that He justifies and regenerates and converts by wisely, sovereignly, uh, jealously, powerfully, and faithfully using the means of the gospel, which He has eternally decreed for His own glory. It's not a plan B. This is something that has always been. So which Christ are we talking about here today? I read, I read those uh, other verses there. We saw in 15 through 19 that He has the same essence and attributes of the Father. He's the Creator. He controls all things by the word of His power through His providence. All things are held together by Him. He is the head of the church. He himself is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. He has all preeminence in all things, and in him all fullness dwells. So this is the Christ that we're talking about, which is not really the average one that you're going to be hearing. Uh, on the way down here, I listened to the radio. I heard like three sermons on the radio. <laughs> Some ridiculous stuff. Wasn't this Christ. It was a different one. So we can rest assured that this God, the only true God, has the wisdom and the power to accomplish His purpose, especially His purpose in salvation. So hopefully by the time we're done here, we can see that, that He's enough to satisfy what God requires and demands from the elect, and that a sinner will not and is not qualified to do anything enough to gain, to maintain in any sense at any level to do anything to make himself become acceptable to God based on who they are or what they do or what comes out of them. Not enough. Not qualified. Can't do it. Don't even try to start. God's people know this. Look at verse 20. So let's look at a few of these things in uh, 20 through 23. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. This reconciliation in salvation is a result of what we talk about that is also in the scriptures, propitiation. Propitiation, some people are scared of that word. It just simply means a satisfaction of God's wrath because of His law and justice. Satisfaction of God's law and justice and wrath, and that results in this uh, reconciliation. Uh, an easier word, really, uh, the idea of peace. We have peace with God when we're reconciled. You know, before we were at enmity with God, we hated God, and as a result of who He is and what He did, we, pre, uh, peace is is brought to us. He's called in Isaiah 9, 6, the Prince of Peace. The Gospel in the Scriptures in a few places called the Gospel of Peace. You know, uh, today when you start asking people about what is the most valuable thing in life once they get serious and even people that are millionaires and famous and stuff that have everything they need, people are searching for peace of mind, right? Very, very valuable. Where we can have it in Christ. We do have it in Christ. God's people do have it. So this idea of, of sin and condemnation, we know it has demands. And God's justice has to be satisfied. It needs to be satisfied. 
And the only way of satisfaction is to have a perfectly sinless sacrifice who answers all these requirements of God's holy law and justice. So God cannot and will not cheat his legal justice system or standard. He demands absolute perfection. He won't compromise his faithfulness to himself, his character. Uh, he will not allow any sin to go and escape without punishment. He is of two pure eyes to behold evil and, and let it slide. He must punish sin, in other words. So the bad news, we always talk about the bad news and the good news. The bad news is that, again, you can never do enough right to make peace with God. It's impossible to do enough works, law and commands. I don't care what quality you think they are, or how many you think you stack up. Sinners are not qualified to begin to get started to do this thing. They're not righteous. They're not good. Romans 3 says this is our state by nature. There is, uh, it doesn't matter how much sincerity or zeal that you think you have to fan some form of a spark to make your passion or desire or sincerity anything at all to go down this path of obeying and becoming acceptable to God. So God demands absolute perfection. You don't have it, but guess what? He still requires it. People get upset about that, like that's not fair. You set God, you set this up this way. <laughs> That's that this is the way that it is. So we by nature don't have any merit, we don't have any value or worth, we don't have a payment that it takes, we can't fulfill terms and conditions for acquiring peace with God. You don't have enough to satisfy what God demands. I heard one preacher, he talked about um, terms of peace. What are some of the ideas for terms of peace? I heard a preacher, a false preacher, in a very popular sermon. The title of the sermon is, It Will Cost You Everything. Dr. Stephen Lawson, I'm going to quote him today. He said, this is what the terms of peace are. And you have transferred all that you are and all that you have to all that he is. That's what it is to meet his terms of peace. Yet the exchange is not bartered or bought with real money, but it is purchased with. Let me stop right there and insert what I, very first time I heard this on video, I thought he's going to say the blood of Christ, right? <laughs> no. No. It is purchased with a total, complete surrender of your life to Christ. That is what saving faith is. It will cost you everything. You don't have enough to pay, you know. We've already, we've already settled that. And this is not what saving faith is. It's the very opposite of what saving faith is. This is faith in yourself. Even if you think you can say, well, it's the Spirit working in me. Nope. So that is never enough. What's it say? Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 39, 5. Man at his best is altogether vanity. So sinful human beings are not qualified. This perfect sacrifice for sin by Christ involves his perfect obedience and his satisfactory blood sacrifice, or in other words, death. And God looks at the merit and the value of that work. Look at verse 21. Now this is talking about, he's writing to these people at Colossae. He, he already said they're believers, they're saints. And he's talking to them. And he said, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. 
All these people experience this. All these people qualified to be described this way. This is everybody universally, by the way. So God's sheep were born into this world totally depraved. Adam's sin was imputed to them. This is the legal ground of their condemnation. This is their, the declaration of death. Guilty. Condemned. That's the ground of total depravity. If you don't have that ground, don't use the word total because it doesn't make sense. After that, the fruit of that is we're, we're born uh, after Adam's image and we have the spiritual death in our nature. And, and, and it has all those spiritual inabilities, right? There's none that seeks after God. There's none that understands. Pretty much that destroys free will. And then on top of it, kind of more deceitful, is this natural defiled conscience that we have. When Adam ate of the fruit, Adam and Eve, was, a conscience was imparted to them. And everybody after them that's born in Adam's image has this defiled conscience by nature. And it, when they sin, and, and notice, notice in, um, well, we're going to get to that verse. It talks about uh, these wicked works that are done. I, I don't, can't remember if I have this in my notes. I always make this distinction. There's two types of wicked works. There's the works of immorality that you can clearly see in the moral law. And then there are the works, evil works of self-righteousness, the religious sins, pride and, and this, this works righteousness mentality that is what flows out of a defiled conscience. When we sin, sin got us into this thing, obedience probably is going to get us out. Let's just go ahead. Let's try, you know. That's the action of the deceitful, defiled conscience. That's the best that it can do is produce self-righteousness. Wicked works. Christ was talking about the scribes and Pharisees a few different places, and he said their deeds were evil. Well, they weren't doing drugs. They weren't doing all these. It's their self-righteous deeds. They hated God in that way. And so... The average person, when he commits immorality, he does both. He commits immorality, and then he tries to make it up with his self-righteousness. We see the weaving of those two ideas of the blending of the two types of wicked works. So by nature, automatically, sinners attempt to reconcile themselves to God in some other way, in every other way, besides God's way. So they're in competition with the God-prescribed way of this righteousness that Christ established and imputed for salvation, for justification and acceptance. So the work, the conditions, the efforts of sinful man, again, are never enough, but will always and only add to their condemnation and just treasure up wrath the more they continue to do this activity. Look at the second part of verse 21. It says, Yet now he has reconciled. How is the only way that this can be done? Verse 22, In the body of his flesh through death. Here we see, you know, he had, he had to be incarnate. He had to have flesh. I'm still going through First John, I might have been going through First John the last three times I preached here, I don't know. But the problem there was they in First John, John was writing against the ones that were denying that Christ had a body. He had to have a body. He had to be made flesh so that he can be a sacrifice for sins. So he did this activity, this work, through the use of his body as a sacrifice. And it took the, the death of this unique person, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, to establish this salvation, accomplish it. And not only was this person unique or exclusive, but his work was also. The, the way it was done was an absolute, perfect, and complete work, a finished work. 
you know, by nature, of course, if you'd bring men into the world, if they hadn't seen anything about the Scripture, and as they grow, and if they could collectively put their minds together and bring up this scenario about sin and say, you know, what, let's just, our collective minds here, how, how would we fix this? It's always by works, right? Automatically. How could it not be? They could never dream up this idea here, uh, this truth of the Scripture of substitutionary atonement by the righteousness of another. I don't think it would have ever came into the mind of man to even do that. So this sacrifice was sufficient. It was effectual by itself without any additions by people adding conditions or contributions to make it effective. Now, we've got to be clear that it is not sufficient at all for the reprobate, for the non-elect, in any sense whatsoever. It is not sufficient because it was not for them. We know that God's particular love and election of God's sheep is eternal, as well as his purposed hatred and decree of eternal condemnation of the reprobate. This is something that was not by accident. It was not a plan B. This is an eternal purpose of God. So his purpose and work for his people is sovereign and particular. God's grace is particular. And we know that through this activity of propitiation that took place, we know that all the demands that were required from us to us that we needed to pay, we couldn't pay. So in the person of Christ as substitute, he satisfied all that was demanded of law and justice before we could be released from our guilt in such a way that he would do it without compromising his own character, breaking his own rules. He, he's not going to do that. He's going to honor his law, his truth, and so on. So this sacrifice, it must be precise in its scheme, accurately measured in its justice, and the value equals to what was demanded in its execution. Otherwise, it would be an abomination in the sight of God. In other words, God met his own standard, right? He met his own standard by Christ taking on the sin of his sheep. So we know that idea was, a, was an imputing, a transferring, a legal, legal reckoning or crediting to the account. Christ took that sin. He volunteered to do it before the foundation of the world. He became guilty for that sin by that legal charge. And he had to put that sin away by the sacrifice of himself. And that's the activity of propitiation. And this is a way that God can do this so that he can be both a just God and a Savior and still honor his character, not pervert justice, not cheat, not lie, not pretend. So we know the Father uh, poured out his wrath on Christ. He had his hand in the death of Christ. We see that in different texts. We, um, Isaiah 53 is pretty clear. So again, this activity of propitiation, it pacified the wrath of God and the results are reconciliation. And so this, is, this work is the greatest expression of God's love. He eternally loved his people. And that work of propitiation is an expression of that love. We see that in 1 John 4. We see that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He loved the world in this way, his people in this way that he sent his son. And so <clears throat> this is a release of debt that we owed because it was the measured value of Christ's work is the only acceptable payment from God's demands because of the sin of the elect. In other words, the merit of his work and God's warrant to justify is based on that ground, and it's backed by the value of that work. 
his completed sacrifice that satisfied God. And again, both a just God and a Savior. This is the only way that could take place. Now, that same law that demanded even Christ's death when those sins were imputed to him and Christ satisfied that law, that same law demands the justification of God's people. Here's God's people. Put the law next to them. How does God see them? Justified based on Christ satisfying that same law. So this is, the I think, the highlight in the sense where you can see that God delights in showing mercy. He Again, that other verse we read in 2 Corinthians 4, how that he glorifies himself in the hearts of his people. Uh, he shows himself for who he is and what he does. And he, he glories in that. I'll read this. You don't have to turn there. Uh, uh, Psalm 85.10, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. This is God being both a just God and a Savior. So the question is, is it enough? What did that sacrifice do? We're going to look at verse 22. Second part. What did it do when he when he he used his body on the cross, took on wrath, and so on? What was the result of that? To present you holy and unblameable and irreprovable in his sight. Looks like a pretty good result, doesn't it? Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. And, that, and that's the only sight that matters, right? I mean, Satan may accuse you. Men may accuse you. But in God's sight, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And that's all that matters. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody. Looks like not even God after this right here, right? And, and gladly so. God is not, you know, he's not frustrated. Uh, he's satisfied. That's the point. That's why he can do this, right? This idea here to present you, it says to present you these three things. Now, let's, let's note here that the merit of his righteousness that he established results in him being able to present his people in this specific way. He's talking to believers, so the, the idea here to present is to exhibit, to recommend, to bring before, to show, or to stand before. And that word is uh, taken from a couple of uh, other ideas here, a root. And it's a, I'm not going to pronounce it. It's, a, it's where we get the word narcotic. And it's a flower. And it's the same name um, as the flower in the original that, that has a strong effect as narcotics do. And it's combined with this, this other word, stand. Um, and so here's the idea. This is, this is the presentation by Christ because of what he did in making them presentable those three things that we mentioned in this verse. And it is presenting us like a pleasing narcotic flower to the Father. Probably a lot of different things flood your minds about different ideas in the Old Testament about a sweet-smelling savor, about um, the opposite, being whatever's a stench and an abomination. Uh, I get my wife flowers uh, every two to three weeks, depending on you know how long they last, and um, and I get to have lunch with her on every Friday. My schedule allows that, and it has for years. And um, I'll get her some flowers. What's the first thing she does? Puts them up to her nose, and she'll give me like a rating, you know, like ooh, you know, this pretty good. They're not narcotic types, but this is even better here. You know, it's like 
Here Christ has taken these people who were a stench, who were an abomination, who did abominable things, and here Christ has made them presentable in this way. And the Father's liking it. So, let's not get confused here. This is not Christ making His people lovable by showing them this by giving the Son to accomplish the work because they were loved eternally already. We already we just covered that like five minutes ago. Why did why was Christ sent? Because of this love. But the activity and the success and the accomplishment of his work reversed the problem of an abomination to presentability and justification. And we know we always hear that verse um, in Ephesians talking about wives or husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the idea. Christ loved his, his people eternally and he gave himself for them at the cross. So this presentation smells like this. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Can, uh, turn if you want to uh, two verses you guys went through Jude not too long ago Jude 24 and 25 said this now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to what present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Verse 23 of our text. This is where a lot of Armenians and Pelagians and free willers and works people want to emphasize this if here and make the whole thing conditional and they don't know what they're talking about this verse 23 is it's self-protective uh, if you if you get a grip on this verse you'll see this it, it is not scary this truth protects itself within the verse if you continue in the faith what is the faith? That's, that's the gospel. That's that body of doctrine that comprises the person and work of Christ and, and the whole of salvation and you know the Trinity and just everything that goes into salvation overall. That's the faith. Now we know through several other texts that God's people are going to believe the gospel. They're given faith to believe it. We're also told they're going to continue to believe it. God works in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. He that began a good work on you, he's going to finish it. He's the author and finish of, of our faith and so on. We will not apostate. We won't leave the faith. Those that do leave the faith were not elect. Those are not his people. It just doesn't work that way. So if you continue in the faith... Now, first of all, I want you to notice that some legalists will, will bring you here and um, not have you look at exactly what it's talking about. And they'll want you to continue in all kind of stuff that they make up. Under, under threats, too, by the way. How do you continue in this faith? Grounded and settled. No wavering. Not thinking, well, I want to look at some other things. I want to try some other things out, like it's some religious buffet. When we come to the faith, we are brought to a point to where it's like, this is it. If I was to leave this and go someplace else, what would it be? Well, I'd, I'd quit. I wouldn't do anything. I'm not going to switch religions because this is the only way. Grounded and settled 
the idea there of settled, I mean, we can rest in this, that this is the only way. We're not enough. He is enough. You know, everything in between these what ifs and maybes, and I'm going to try this and that, that that's just all the denominations. And you go, to, you go to each denomination that preaches a false gospel, and they're going to have a different category of things that you do. And it's all about, you know, frequency of sin versus frequency of obedience. And they have their different means and methods. They, the two, one church compared to the other might, it might be the super formalism. And over here, they're doing, you know, a concert. Everything in between. In a word, foolishness. You know, just a bunch of foolishness and lies. And nobody's grounded and settled. Everybody, unless they're deceived, they think they're grounded and settled, but they have that burden that's always eaten on them. Most of, most of you guys were probably in false religion before you believed the gospel. And there was always that idea that was eating at you that you have not done enough, right? Had that burden on your back. Well, maybe maybe I'll learn enough or somebody will coach me enough or um, I'll read some books, you know, some kind of spiritual secret. i got to figure this thing out. i got this burden on my back because I'm not doing enough. Grounded and settled is like, I, I surrender. I submit. I can't do enough. I know that now and forever. Amen. This is what rest in Christ is. Rest in Christ, who is enough. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. All those things are connected and all those things blend and they they're fortified together. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. They stick together. Now, anybody that's a believer, I mean, seriously, why would you want to do anything different than this? Anybody that has spiritual life will not want to do something like this because they know this is the only Christ who performed the only acceptable work and this faith is the one that defends this one who did this work and anything outside of that is false religion and antichrist so who in their right spiritual mind would want to walk away from this or leave this or change nobody and God's people don't. Oh, there's there's attempts. People coming in, saying stuff. And some of God's people, they'll get lax and they'll put an ear to something. And they'll get they'll get wonky for a while until they're brought back. But not in finality. God's people believe the gospel to the end. This word hope here is is not this like I wish, you know. It's not this stressful crossing your fingers thing. It's a confident expectation is what that word means. So it doesn't say, if you continue sinning less and getting better as you sin less, it's not there. People want to infuse that in there. So to be shown that your work will never be enough and that Christ's work is enough, it's not just barely enough. It, 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 he says that he saves to the uttermost, right? You, you read things about grace and about Christ and things like Romans 5, for example, it talks about much more where sin abounded graced abound much more. That's some uttermost language right there that's tied to Christ's sufficiency. So your work will never be enough. Christ's work is enough to save the uttermost. And that is the consideration here today of resting in the finished work of Christ for your only hope and assurance. 
He that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Good works after salvation, different sermon. But when we're talking about salvation, some of these lordshippers will say, it's faith alone that's never alone. Better be for salvation. I'll tell you that right now. It better be for salvation. Because if it's a faith that has works and you're counted for salvation, you're not saved. You don't have God, as it says in 1 John. Let's conclude by looking at uh, just three verses. You can go to Galatians 6. This should be our, our, our theme or our thought concerning what we get excited about. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory. There's one exception. There's one place. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, have, have we let that... Do, do you have that memorized? You should have it memorized. Let it... You marinate in that. This, is, this should be assurance here. That is our only place to glory, which obviously is not in ourselves, right? By, and how much should we glory in it? By whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. The world encompasses the unbelieving world. They oppose you in this glory. Because why? They want to glory in the flesh, right? For in Christ Jesus, that is your that is your union with Him. God imputes righteousness, and you're in union with Him by faith. You're considered to be in Christ and no longer in Adam. In Christ, neither circumcision avails, doesn't have any strength. Circumcision does not avail anything, nor uncircumcision. Doesn't matter either way but a new creature. Are you a new creation or a new creature in Christ? Have you been moved over from the abomination category to the sweet-smelling Savior of that narcotic flower as you've been presented those three things? Now you're in Christ. You're out of Adam. You're not under law. You're under grace. You're dead to sin. And as many as walk according to this rule. And I believe the rule is in verse 14. God forbid that I should glory except on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is my rule. Peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God, which is not somebody separate. There's one Israel of God, I believe. It's the spiritual seed of Abraham, those that believe the promise of salvation conditioned on Christ alone. I hope that was helpful today. And I um, hope not too many people on the camera noticed that there was a fly, just like. I didn't want to swing too. I got a bad shoulder. I didn't want to throw my shoulder out swinging at the fly. But anyway, I hope that was uh, edifying to you. And. Um, Hope that you can um, meditate on these things and be helpful to you. Thanks for listening.